Hi, Chris Potts here. This is part three in our screencast series on the paper by Levine, Glass, and Jurafsky titled Systematicity and the Semantics of Noun Compounds, the Role of Artifacts versus Natural Kinds. Screencasts one and two in the series give an overview of the background motivations and core hypotheses for this work, and so they're really prerequisites for this screencast. Do watch them first if you haven't already. What this screencast does is review the three main studies from the paper that seek to inform the event-related modifier hypothesis and the essence-related modifier hypothesis. The first study is a corpus study. Uh, let's start with the design of this study, which is pretty intuitive. First, the example sources. So the examples come from online databases from the domains of food and cooking and from jewelry and precious minerals. Uh, the authors just downloaded really big lists of compound nouns from these sites to try to get naturalistic representative samples. Now, I really like this approach, but we should have in mind that the choice of examples here is gonna define the study in clear ways. And so we should think about this when we think about limitations of the study. I don't have any specific concerns in mind, but we should ask at some point what would happen if we focused on different domains and example sources. In any event, once they had their set of compound nouns, they conducted an annotation study. Uh, the study is centered around a set of annotation guidelines that the team constructed. Those guidelines are summarized in table two here, and they're given in full detail in an appendix in the paper. If we were actual annotators, we'd wanna study this full manual in detail. Uh, for now, we can just do a kind of high level overview. You can see it's pretty fine grained, more fine grained than our guiding hypotheses, but it's also really clear how these finer grained categories can be grouped together to connect with the hypotheses. So in, the, in these guidelines, we begin with the event-related modifiers, which we expect to be dominant for artifacts. Uh, made of and method are grouped under creation. Um, under event of use, we have purpose, time, used by, object nom for object nominal, nominalization. Uh, then we move on to the essence-related modifiers. Uh, borrowed is one of the subcategories of the essence-related modifier hypothesis. Environmental is another such subcategory, and it groups location, and social political. Perceptual is the third major subcategory for the essence-related modifier hypothesis, and here it groups color, dimension, distinctive part, taste, smell, and visual. And then we have a few others that seem more heterogeneous and have some special instructions. For example, the named after category is designated as falling under used by, which is an event-related category. So if you were one of the annotators, you'd be asked to study this manual and then you'd go through the data set of compound nouns assigning some labels. And then it's clear what the Levine et al. group can do. They can aggregate those low-level labels into the larger categories from the manual, uh, and those connect with the two overarching hypotheses of the paper. So what's it like to do this work? Uh, here I've got a little sample of compounds, and we can use table two as a sort of reference card. Uh, kidney bean, I'd say myself that that's visual. Pinto bean, also visual. Uh, bunt cake, well, I know that refers to the shape of the pan used to create these cakes, so I guess I would say that's method. Uh, depression cake, this one is unfamiliar to me. I happen to remember that this is a cake that's associated with the Depression era in the 1930s, but I can easily imagine someone thinking that it's something about the appearance of the cake. Uh, charm bracelet, I think distinctive part makes sense for charm bra bracelet but I might be tempted by social political since charm here seems like it could be abstract and related to people giving gifts on certain occasions or something. And I myself am not really sure what a charm is as a distinctive part, although I have some sense. A bubble necklace, I really don't know what this is. So I'd probably go for visual and assume it has some distinctive design that resembles bubbles or something. So we did this as a Zoom poll last year uh, and here are some of the results. Uh, for pinto bean, you can see there is some variation, but with the exception of named after, all these responses align with the essence-related modifier hypothesis since they're all grouped under borrowed or perceptual as expected, given that this is a natural kind. Now, the one exception is that named after is subsumed by used by, which is event-related. For bunt cake, the dominant response is method, which aligns with the event-related modifier hypothesis since this is an artifact. Made of responses and named after responses also align with the hypothesis, but social political 
dimension, visual, and borrowed, those are all essence related. Depression cake seems to have a lot of uncertainty. The dominant response is social political, which is an essence related category, even though depression cakes are artifacts. And bubble necklace is also sort of unexpected from the point of view of the hypotheses. The dominant response is visual, which I believe to be correct for bubble necklaces, but that's an, an essence related category as is dimension made of and used by our event related though. So this is a tricky one. Obviously for this little study, I favored hard cases. Um, when we stick to things like pinto beans and birthday cakes, I think we see almost total systematicity, but I chose this little sample to give you a sense for the range of issues that the annotators likely faced when they were doing their work. The work itself was done by three linguistics graduate students who were uninformed about the goals of the study. For the purposes of the study, we do a simple operationalization of the core hypotheses. We're going to say compounds referring to artifacts should have event modifiers, and compounds referring to natural kind should have perceptual, environmental, or borrowed modifiers. And in this table here, I've given a slightly simplified view of the results they obtained from this study. Overall, these results very clearly align with the core hypotheses. For example, 84.2% of natural kind compounds have essence related modifiers and 57.9% of artifact compounds have event related modifiers. Very nice in terms of our guiding hypotheses. I'll quickly add that the paper includes a nice little statistical analysis of these results to further bolster the picture. We're not going to discuss this analysis in detail because I think it would just be a distraction um, but the essence of it is that they use what are called chi-squared tests to understand whether the numbers in this table are different from what you would expect by chance, including the fact that the distribution of these items is uneven across the categories. So what we essentially do is test some hypotheses like this. Is this number 548 larger than you would expect, given that there are 651 natural kinds and roughly 1,000 perceptual, environmental, or borrowed modifiers? And the results of those tests are that yes, these numbers are oversized relative to what you'd expect given that null hypothesis. So that's reassuring that we can reason about this table and say that it supports our overarching hypotheses. That's great. So taking stock, we have strong corpus evidence that seems to be validating our core hypotheses at a descriptive level. However, we don't really know what's shaping these results yet. Is it knowledge of language or just an emergent pattern from the way things tend to be named in similar ways to other things and so forth? So to try to distinguish these two hypotheses, we need to move beyond observational data and see what people do when they have to produce or interpret novel compounds. That will help us see whether the hypotheses generalize to new cases in ways that suggest an underlying capacity that we all have as users of the language. Levine et al.'s first step in that direction is a production experiment. We're going to see what happens when people are asked to produce novel compound forms. And the hypotheses we'll work with here are given in 17. These are just more specific versions of the event and essence related hypotheses. For artifacts, we expect to see more use related modifiers. And for natural kinds, we expect to see appearance or place of origin. The experimental design kind of nudges people to think about deciding between these two broad categories. So here's an example item to give you a feel for how this worked. As a participant, you're prompted with some context like you subscribe to a service that sends you new food items every month. This month, you receive a new type of chickpea. And then you get three facts about this chickpea. It comes from Istanbul, it's green in color, and you use it to make hummus. And then the key question for you is what two word name would you give to this new food? And as a participant, you could respond with whatever you wanted. I've given some examples from the experiment in 19. If you said Istanbul pea, that would be a place categorization. If you said green chickpea, that would be appearance. And if you said hummus chickpea, that would be use. Now we expect to see more place and appearance choices given that a chickpea is a natural kind. We don't expect categorical effects uh, but we do expect consistency suggesting systematicity, assuming that these compound patterns we've seen trace to our knowledge and expectations about how the language works. 
The experiment was crowdsourced and it included some distractor sentences, some prompts to avoid having participants fully guess what the experimental goals were. Uh, and here's a summary of what the results look like. So numerically, these results support the core hypotheses. Overwhelmingly, for natural kinds, participants used modifiers related to place or appearance. 95.6% of the modifiers for natural kinds fell into this category. For artifacts, on the other hand, the bias is in the expected direction, but it's admittedly less strong. So as before, the team further supported these numerical results with a statistical analysis. In this case, they used a regression model in which the nature of the object that is artifact or natural kind is used to predict the modifier type. And that directly keys into the core hypotheses. And they also included some predictors that are meant to capture the unanalyzed sources of variation that come from different participants and different experimental items. This is what we call a mixed effects model. We don't need to dive into the details of the analysis. I will just say that in general, it fully supports the picture that you see highlighted in table six here. Great, so in conclusion, when we produce compounds, even new ones, we do so in a way that conforms to the core hypotheses of the paper. The final study is a comprehension study and it's designed to give us a sense for how people interpret novel compounds. I've called it a free response comprehension study because our own in-class experiment was what you might call a forced choice comprehension study, which is very different. Step zero for the team in this paper, so to speak, is to do what we call a norming study. And they did this to find some novel compounds that sound reasonably natural to people. Here's the full set, it's given in Appendix B of the paper. Uh, in 20 and 21 here, I have some example items from the experiment, the first for an artifact and the second for a natural kind. If you were a participant in the experiment, you got a prompt like this. Imagine that you encounter the compound stew skillet. What would you think this refers to? And then you got to just write your own description, free form. Uh, these are some actual responses from the experiment, and you can see that all of them refer to use, an event classification, which is just what we'd expect from an artifact. For 21, uh, as a participant, you would read this prompt. Imagine that you encounter the compound's swamp squash. What would you think this refers to? And here are all the responses are, are clearly location ones according to our methods. Again, as you'd expect from a natural kind. For the experiment itself, they randomized the order of items and they had 20 distractor sentences. The design is what's called a cross design. Uh, this is meant to ensure that, for example, if as a participant you saw bean towel, you didn't also see beer towel. And this helps to avoid influences across the two factors. And also everyone saw a balanced combination of modifier head combinations. So they all saw a balanced sample from these two lists here. Uh, this is the same general design that we used in our forced choice version of the experiment, though our experiment was quite a bit smaller in terms of the number of items. Now, since these are free responses, they need to be coded, and that work was once again done by the authors. And here are the results, and these are really interesting. So you have the four combinations of modifier and head, artifact, artifact, natural kind, artifact, artifact, natural kind, and natural kind, natural kind. For the artifact head cases, the results are very clear. Essentially, all of them are event related, and that keys into that use idea that you see expressed in these hypotheses from earlier. Very few of these responses refer to perceptual or environmental qualities. So that's a clear win for the event-related modifier hypothesis. For cases where the head is a natural kind, the picture is more nuanced. So for natural kind, natural kind combinations like stream vegetable, those almost always have perceptual environmental interpretations. And that's a very clear picture, perfectly in line with the core hypotheses of the paper. The picture is more nuanced though, as you can see for artifact natural kind combinations. The expectation is that most of the responses would be over here in this gray cell under perceptual environmental. However, that's not quite what happened. Only 34% are in that bin and 66% in turn are event related. I think it's worth thinking more about why this row is different. Nonetheless, I think the overall pattern here is what you would expect to see. And again, they report a statistical analysis that bolsters that a bit. We don't need to think too much about this. There's maybe one interesting thing to highlight, though. 
So first it's a regression model, just like in the previous experiment that had those mixed effects that try to account for unanalyzed sources of variation coming from participants and items. At a fundamental level though, what the model does is use the modifier type, that is artifact or natural kind, and the head type with that same distinction to predict the overall interpretation. And for at least one variant of the model they look at, they included an interaction between the modifier type and the head type. And the interpretation of that factor is kind of interesting, right? So the modifier matters more when the head is a natural kind than when it's an artifact. So for example, if you look at the artifact heads, the modifier type doesn't really matter for the overall interpretation. It's event related either way. But for natural kind heads, the modifier seems to be a major factor in shaping the final interpretation. So there's something really interesting here that's being captured in this interaction term in their model. And this again suggests that we could do more work to probe the natural kind head cases. And that seems like a happy place to end overall, right? The summary of this is clear. We have very consistent evidence from diverse sources for the core hypotheses of the paper. And we got some clues about interesting and informative next steps that we could explore for noun compounds in English.